A very warm welcome to this, the fifth of our series of Gifford Lectures at the University of Edinburgh for the academic session 2011-2012. My name is Stuart Brown. I'm a professor of ecclesiastical history, head of the School of Divinity, and vice convener of the Gifford Lectureships Committee. We have a full house tonight. We've been enjoying a superb series of Gifford Lectures from Professor Dermot McCulloch, Professor of the History of Christianity at the University of Oxford, on the theme of silence in the history of the church. The lectures have brought together the ripe fruit of a lifetime of research and reflection on the history of Christianity. They have also been a meditation on religion as something vital to the human condition on the noise and clamor of religious observance and evangelization, and also on the silence of religious devotion, contemplation, and sometimes of fear and shame. The lecture this evening will be recorded. The first two lectures in the series are already freely available online in video, and the rest of the lectures will soon be available. Professor McCulloch, could I now invite you to present the fifth of your Gifford lectures on the theme of getting behind noise in Christian history. Professor McCulloch. Thank you, Professor Brown. So getting behind noise in Christian history. So far, we've traced a story largely about overt or official history. Now I'm going to move on to examine some other more oblique varieties of silence to consider, few of which, I'm afraid, reflect very positively on the bodies which call themselves Christ churches. The Catholic Christianity, which we observed emerging in the second century, was marked by an exclusivity, an intolerance of rivals, which had dramatic effects once bishops made their alliance with the secular power. Now Christians really could aspire to exclude the other. And in such circumstances over the centuries, particular groups who represented the other, some Christian, some not, have made themselves invisible simply in order to survive. They have become what John Calvin in the 16th century contemptuously called Nicodemites, a phrase to which we'll return. And Nicodemism is not the only silence to consider. The history of Christianity is also full of things casually or deliberately forgotten, things left unsaid in order to shape the future of a church or churches. And some of those silences are, uh, as we've just heard, uh, in, uh, suggested, conscious silences of shame and fear at the church not living up to its own standards of truth and compassion. Well, Mediterranean Christians seem to have learned very little from their experiences of being persecuted by the Roman Empire. They enthusiastically oppressed and imprisoned each other once the imperial authorities gave them the chance. And thanks to its invention of inquisitions, the Latin Church of the West has the worst record of all, both to dissenting Christians and to religions which disturbed its medieval monoculture, Jews and Muslims. Medieval Christian secrecy was dwarfed by hidden Judaism in Spain and Portugal, which gave many clues to Christians in later centuries about preserving a hidden identity. The first large-scale Jewish forced conversions to Christianity came in pogroms in 1391. And after that, Spanish converso Christians frequently remained really secret Jews. And it was hardly surprising that the Spanish Inquisition was so paranoid about the hidden menace of Judaism when you realize that the first two inquisitors general of the Inquisition, uh, Tomás de Torquemada and his successor, Bishop Diego Deza, were both from Jewish families. Such officials had a great deal of personal baggage to live down. <laughs> 
And one of the most exciting reappraisals of Christian history in recent years has been to recapture the place of this secret Judaism and Islam in the 16th century Reformation. Many of the responses to the Reformation's violence were conditioned and shaped by that earlier story, particularly of the Jews, the violence of Iberian Christians against Jews and Muslims together. And much of European radical Christianity, which we looked at last time, stems from that Iberian underworld. Now, by its very nature, clandestine religion might seem unlikely to produce justifications. But the interesting feature of the 15th and 16th centuries, which launched so many of these clandestinities, was that politics as much as religion had spawned an unprecedented torrent of talk about dissimulation and the reasons why it might be desirable or undesirable or despicable even. Now, most of these themes would have been obvious to cynical monarchs for centuries before, but it was the increasing bureaucratic sophistication of government which meant that lots of people needed to talk about them now because they were involved in administration, in politics. And Renaissance humanism gave politicians a bonanza of newly available texts, ancient texts, which had little to do with Christian theology. Uh, but uh, were very useful indeed to a Christian society. Analytical discussions of politics by Cicero at one end to the hermetic literature which hovered on the frontiers of ancient Judaism and early Catholic Christianity, like Gnosticism. The very essence of the wisdom ascribed to the fictitious Egyptian priest Hermes Trismegid Trismegistus was that it was hidden, that was the attraction, it was esoteric, it promised power to its adepts. And in this new secular literature, there were also new names. The most notorious among them, Niccolo Machiavelli. Now, it was soon generally considered good form in the 16th century to express your disapproval of Machiavelli for his cynicism. But that didn't stop courtiers and others finding him extremely useful. Uh, and so rather than praise Machiavelli, very frequently people praised an ancient writer who was also cynical, Tacitus back in the first century of the Common Era. And, and it's a very common strategy in the 16th century to show your interest in some safely remote classical author to dis discuss something very risky, like dissimulation or atheism or sodomy. You go to some ancient writer and then you won't get burnt at the stake if you talk about it. Now there then is a sort of sec secular discourse among the chattering classes of the Renaissance period. But there was an equally noisy debate among theologians. Uh, and those of you who may have been at an earlier lecture may remember the, the great spat between two fourth century literary giants, Augustine of Hippo and Jerome, about lying. You may remember Jerome thought that lying could be a good thing and Augustine thought that uh, it was a bad thing in all circumstances. And no prizes for guessing that that arch-Augustinian of the 16th century, John Calvin, thought that lying was a very bad thing indeed. And he made a series of fierce rebukes to those who weren't prepared to follow his own action in fleeing from his native country for his faith. And so in 1544, he made that resonant coinage, the word Nicodemite, in the title of the pamphlet published in that year, Excuse à Monsieur les Nicodémites sur la complainte qu'ils font, qu font de sa trop grande rigueur. Now, this pamphlet sneered at those who took their cue from Jesus' secret disciple Nicodemus, who you may remember in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 1 to 2, would only visit his Lord by night and not by day. So a Nicodemite is one who will only be a clandestine disciple of the Lord. Calvin had a talent for this sort of loaded neologism. He was very good at inventing these sneering words. Uh, not everyone agreed, even among the mainstream reformers, that he was right, and not, uh, not a few were slow, not slow to point out that it was all very well for Calvin to say this from his comfortable study in the, behind the walls of Geneva, was well, not so easy for other people. And among the doubters was the great pastor of Strasbourg, Martin Butzer, long in Strasbourg until forced to flee himself into England in 1549, where he became much involved in the developing English Reformation. Now, Butzer was a man whom John Calvin regarded as a mentor in very many respects. 
But Butzer's opinion of his protégé's opinion on Nicodemism can be gauged by a long private manuscript treatise which Butzer wrote on this subject probably in 1541. In other words, just before uh, John Calvin went public with this discussion. And this is about the necessity in many circumstances for discretion in the circumstances of the Reformation. It went so far to say, in direct contradiction of Calvin three years later, that pastoral office may currently be exercised in papist churches. So possible for clergy uh, of a Protestant uh, conviction to stay within the Roman church if necessity arose. Now, Butzer never put this manuscript into print. But it's extremely interesting that two manuscript copies of it are to be found in England. And one of them was in the, the library of a future Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury, Matthew Parker. He was a friend and admirer of Butzer, and he became the first Archbishop of Canterbury in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, part of the Elizabethan settlement of 1559. Now, that settlement was unprecedented among the official reformations of 16th century Europe because it was planned and executed entirely by former Nic Nicodemites. Protestants, convinced Protestants, who had nevertheless conformed outwardly to the return to Rome under Queen Mary Tudor from the moment that Mary had secured her throne against Queen Jane Grey. Foremost in this group of Nicodemites was the queen herself. But she was ably assisted by two secular politicians, brothers-in-law, William Sissel and Nicholas Bacon, plus among the leading clergy, Matthew Parker, first Archbishop of Canterbury, William May, her first nominee for Archbishop of York, the Dean of Westminster Abbey, Gabriel Goodman, and the Dean of the Chapel Royal, her cousin, George Carew. All those clergy had served actively, not just passively, actively in the Church of Mary Tudor, although they took care to cover their tracks in the history afterwards. To a man, they were all convinced Protestants, but you see, they had all been Nicodemites. And if William May had not died prematurely, and, and so not become Archbishop of York, that Nicodemite team would entirely have kept at bay from the very top of the Elizabethan uh, pol political and religious scene all those Edwardian Protestants who'd gone into exile under Mary for their faith. Now, Elizabeth I's notorious detestation of all things Genevan is often attributed to the political ineptitude of John Calvin's Scottish admirer, John Knox. But this puts a different light on things. If her primate of all England was the custodian of one copy of Butzer's aggressive, tra aggressive tract against Calvin's argument, it raises the possibility that she may have been angrily conscious that Calvin would see her as the object of his principal contempt. Her affirmation of her English Messieurs les Nicodemites in her plans for her church tell us much about her conduct as Supreme Governor of the Church of England. Continuously from the 1570s, Elizabethan England was either openly or privately at war with Catholic Europe, principally, of course, Spain. As a result, England judicially murdered more Roman Catholics than any other country in Europe during Elizabeth's reign. But Elizabeth's government behaved very differently to those Catholics who did not seek to defy her as recusants, those who refused recusare, to go to her services. Instead, Catholic Nicodemites went to their parish churches and kept their counsel. Even most declared Catholic recusants at some stages in their lives did that. And a much larger pop proportion of the population of England also did so as a congenial solution to their religious dilemmas. From at least 1582, these deliberately evanescent folk were abusively known as church papists. And it was a highly desirable and highly successful category from the point of view of the Elizabethan government. It was one of the foundations of consolidating, establishing the Elizabethan Reformation without having civil war. And what's fascinating about this Catholic Nicodemism is that both polarities on the religious divide had an interest in loudly condemning it. 
Church papistry threatened all those who were seeking to build religious identities in a time of struggle. Mainstream Western European religious commentators were saddled with the assumption of a religious monopoly in society, and so they portrayed the religious divisions of the Reformation entirely in binary terms. You are either evil or you are great, and anything in the middle just didn't figure. They were happiest when the opposition of the binary poles was most effectively demonstrated. And so you get an amusing concurrence between Puritans and Jesuits that recusancy was the right thing to do for Catholics. At least, Puritans thought, it, an up, a firm upholding of the mass showed principle, even if it was a principle very badly applied, as one Puritan sourly observed. And the, but the parallel and awkward reality was that even those who advocated steadfastness the most Jesuits and Puritans, were just as much caught up in the 16th century industry of dissimulation as any church papist. Because in general, both sides preferred living to, living to fight another day to making an exemplary death. In the case of the Society of Jesus, the English mission was the first great proving ground for that essential element in Jesuit pastoral training, cases of conscience or casuistry. Take, for instance, uh, a Jesuit who is captured and brought to trial under Elizabeth. What do you do? Well, you know that Elizabethan authority is not legitimate because Pope Pius V had excommunicated the Queen and thus declared her deposed. So, in front of one of her courts, any pretense is lawful. After all, uh, had not Christ pretended to his disciples at Emmaus, saying that he was going to go on the road with them, and then he disappeared? That's dissimulation. <laughs> Luke chapter 24, verse 28. So pious equivocation is not the same as lying. Silence or returning a question as a question are not lying. And Puritans copied this strategy when brought before the same sort of ecclesiastical courts of the Church of England. Particularly uncomfortable and infuriating for Puritans was to be faced with the demand in church courts to observe the perfectly normal but pre-Reformation procedure of that court. Swearing an oath under examination to reply truthfully to all questions, ex officio it's called. And Puritans who took that oath frequently exhibited really rather similar strategies to the Jesuits, uh, instantly recognizable to anyone teaching casuistry at the English College in Rome. And they were prepared to extend this strategy against the anti-Christian church outside the courtroom. Very striking example of this constructive casuistry came from the colorful and humorous Puritan gentleman, Job Throckmorton. Almost certainly, Job Throckmorton was the author of the outrageously successful series of attacks on the English bishops called the Martin Mar Prelate Tracts. Almost certain he wrote them. They look exactly like his own writings. Generations of gullible modern historians have taken Job Throckmorton at his word that he didn't write them. But those denials can easily be knocked down if you take the simplest manual of casuistry off the shelf and see exactly what he said. Job Throckmorton said, I am not Martin. Well, true, because he was Job Throckmorton. <laughs> I knew not Martin, he added. True as well, because Martin was not a person. He was a literary invention. And so Job, Job Throckmorton was not Martin Marprelate. Of course he was. <laughs> as one might predict, the greatest glorying in casuistry and concealment among Western Christians of the Reformation came from radicals. Not all of those radicals derived from Spain or Portugal. Some were native to Northwest Europe from Switzerland, Strasbourg, and the Low Countries. And you may remember, if you were here last time, the angry disagreement which separated the chief spokesmen within this movement. On the one hand, Kaspar Schwenkfeld and Sebastian Frank, spirituals from Anabaptists who maintained the Protestant insistence on the authority of scripture. And the chasm in authority between Schwenkfeld and Frank and the Anabaptists on the other side uh, illuminates this problem of concealment. Because think of the implications. Western European Anabaptists look keenly at the New Testament. They're concerned to play their part in restoring the primitive purity of the church. 
described within its pages. And of course, that includes the account of the trial and martyrdom of Stephen. So that is their model. Anabaptists look to Stephen. Martyrdom becomes central to their identity. Now, Schwenkfeld considered that sort of belief profoundly mistaken because the church in this generation was too imperfect to think of purifying. So there was no point in being martyred for it. That could only be happen in God's good time when the church uh, was purified by the spirit. And so spirituals were inclined to consider any public wit wit witness to be misguided uh, in radical Christians just as much as in Protestants. Martyrdom was a silly thing to do. It was a distraction from the true tranquility with which Christians ought to live out their sufferings in the world. That resonant thought of tranquility, apatheia, gelassenheit, all that cluster of words which we've seen roll down from Evagrius of Ponticus back in the 4th century through Meister Eckhart in the 14th century. Now the spirituals were picking up this vocabulary for their own purposes. And think of all the echoes in this discussion between Frank uh, and Schwenkfeld on the one hand, Anabaptists on the other, martyrdom against non-martyrdom. Think back to the Gnostics, what they said in the second century about this, against the Episcopal Church, which was encouraging gullible Christians to martyr themselves. Once more, activism, public witness, was ranged against those who placed a particular value on silence or, uh, 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 and avoidance of inappropriate and unnecessary Conflict. Now, the most extreme Nicodemites of the 16th century, and in many ways arguably the most successful, though they did disappear in the 17th century, were a small mystical sect called the Family of Love. The Family of Love began in the Low Countries sometime in the 1540s or 50s. They spread into England. Their founder was a man called Hendrik Niklas who habitually signed himself in his writings by his initials H.N., which by a happy or divinely inspired coincidence also are the beginnings of the phrase homo nobus, new man. H.N. was the latest version of God on earth, the version, a very radical version of theosis, in which he included his followers. They were so full of God's spirit that they were part of the Godhead. And they had no reason, therefore, to disclose their identity to the profane world outside. Familism was very awkward for magisterial Protestants. Not only was it, of course, it heretical, but it, it destroyed their cherished stereotype of radicals as crazed, illiterate wretches. Familists were not like that. They were precisely the sort of people you would expect to feel within themselves the creative call of the spirit. Artists musicians, scholars. Among their number, for instance, was the great Dutch painter, Peter Bruegel the Younger. Familists also had a distinct liking for the powerful, which was very helpful for their survival. <laughs> they would melt into any church, Catholic or Protestant, and they would go for the top. So, for instance, in Antwerp, King Philip of Spain's printer, the royal printer, Christophe Plantin, was a familist. By day, he printed the king's Catholic breviaries and missals for the Counter-Reformation Netherlands, and by night, he printed familist literature. He also printed the local uh, edition of the Roman Index uh, of 1570, which banned some of Mr. H.N.'s works. <laughs> One of the Spanish councillors in the Netherlands, of King, Philip, King Philip's councillors, Benito Arios Montano, was a close collaborator and friend with Plantin, uh, in producing that prodigious work of scholarship, the Antwerp Polyglot Bible. He also became a familist sympathizer, and thanks to his Jewish converser background, he knew a lot about concealment. These things link up. And both Plantin and Montano died in their beds in Antwerp, much honored. The family's desire to spread its good news was confined, indeed, to quiet conversations and unobtrusive pamphlets. And otherwise, they just melted into the background, confident in this divine status which put them an above normal ethical considerations. One extraordinary example of their success was their parasitism at the established Church of England in the little Cambridgeshire village of Bolsham. Some of you who saw my recent TV series will have been to Bolsham already. The rector of Bolsham was one Dr. Andrew Pern a very senior academic in the University of Cambridge, master of Peterhouse, no less. 
and he has remained famous as one of the most shameless floor crossers in the English Reformation. One moment a Catholic, one moment a Protestant. Andrew Perrin a Papist, Andrew Perrin a Protestant, they used to say as his uh, weather vane on Peter House swung round with the initials <laughs> AP, AP. <laughs> and significantly, Perrin did nothing to stop the takeover of Bolsham by the Familists during the 1580s even though he had himself investigated their authority, their, their activities for the Diocese of Ely. Pern would not have been the only familist clergyman to serve in the Church of England. So Bolsham became home to the most blatant familist colony in all Europe. In 1609, to the fury of Bolsham villagers not inside the clique, the, fam the familists gave one of their leaders, a man called Thomas Lawrence, an especially honourable burial using the stone tomb of a medieval priest in the churchyard, which special honour implied that Thomas Lawrence was the local Mr. H.N. There was a great row about it, but you can still see the tomb to this day in the churchyard. And after that, you can climb Bolsham Church Tower to view the three bells given in that same year, 1609, I guess, as a memorial to Thomas Lawrence. And one of them bears the unusual inscription in Latin, I do not sound for the souls of the dead, but for the ears of the living. And the words souls and ears are reversed in the Latin, in a piece of private impudence to those souls in Bolsham who did not hear aright. How the family must have smiled inwardly, of course, as they heard Bolsham Church's bells ringing for morning prayer from the Book of Common Prayer. And concerning the familists, there is a still greater marvel, which turns back full circle to the arch Nicodemite of magisterial Protestantism, Queen Elizabeth I. Great was the public consternation in the 1580s when some of the yeomen of the guard, the Queen's personal security force, turned out to be members of the family of love. Puritans raged. Elizabeth, most enigmatic of monarchs, did nothing. And familists continued to flourish at the Elizabethan court. What does that say about the Queen's own involvement with these ultra-loyal Nicodemites? And it went on under James I. There were still familists at court, including the Keeper of the Lions in the Tower of London. Now, somewhere in all that, I think, is one of the greatest silences of Christian history. And certainly it is not part of the founding story of Anglicanism, which Anglicans have yet decided to hear. Now, what this story of Reformation concealment reveals is that there was a pleasant complexity and hesitancy among the deep divisions of the Reformation. Enough people were pre prepared in practice to make the situation much more complex and untidy to create out of a million small silences a practical neighborliness and toleration. Now let me move you now to modern times. We've drawn many lessons from Reformation and Counter-Reformation Nicodemisms, and you can apply all of them afresh to another remarkable phenomenon of Christian history, which has persisted from the mid-19th century up to the present day the existence of a Nicodemite male homosexual subculture within the High Church Anglicanism of the Church of England and the Anglican Communion, otherwise known as Anglo-Catholicism. This has been a voice within the Anglo-Catholic movement which, just like familism in the bell tower at Bolsham, is simultaneously audible to those with ears to hear and not heard by others. A perfect example of Christian Nicodemism. John Calvin would have recognized the character of the Nicodemite in the closet gay man of the 20th century. Well, how did this happen? How did gay male Anglo-Catholicism feature in the Oxford movement from its earliest days? Homosexuality is a word with a very short history. And in the minds of some modern historians who should know better, that's obscured the obvious likelihood that varied patterns of behavior, various homosexual identities are as old as the human race itself. And among those varieties, what one might term the modern Western Enlightenment form, centering on same-sex relationships between equals, is first detectable from the 1690s, first in the Netherlands and then in England, pioneering what became a more general phenomenon in the Western world. 
It became visible quite suddenly during the 1690s, 1710s, as part of a rapid, extraordinary shift in attitudes to sexual behavior generally, which in the succeeding three centuries has come to privileged privacy, mutual emotional fulfillment, and equality over punitive religious discipline. Look at the 1660s, it feels utterly different from the 1730s. It's that quick. But this gay subculture did not emerge in the Protestant Church of England. It could find no immediate home in the 18th century church. The difference came with the Oxford movement in the early 1830s. Tractarians in Oxford aimed to make their church Catholic in far closer approximation to the Church of Rome than would have been thought possible by earlier high church people in England, Ireland and Scotland who generally still gloried in the name of Protestant. You could hear that fossil in the former name of the Episcopal Church of the United States, which was founded in the 1780s as the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States. But from 1830, this word Protestant became uh, rather a word with frisson among the Tractarians and subsequent Anglo-Catholics, a newly created identity. Protestant Episcopal churches spread from Britain and the United States to become a worldwide faith with yet another new name, Anglicanism. Anglicanism really is no older than the 19th century as an identity. So Anglo-Catholicism became a worldwide mo movement too. And from its earliest years, it took with it a strong homoerotic, homosocial element. There's been nothing quite like that in Roman Catholicism, at least until the transfer of Anglo-Catholic clergy to Rome in recent years. The pioneer of that movement was, of course, a 19th century clergyman, John Henry Newman. And the homosexual identity of Cardinal Newman has been the subject of intense controversy. Made much more tangled by the enthusiasm for his canonization among some of the most ethically conservative in the present day Roman Catholic Church. Well, after a survey of Newman's emotional life, his passionate friendships with other single men, of whom his companion in the grave, Ambrose St. John, was just the most long-lasting, his tortured opinions about his own sinfulness, his obvious reveling in the homosocial world of early Victorian Oxford, it's difficult to apl avoid applying to Newman that useful variant of Occam's razor. Looks like a duck, waddles like a duck, <laughs> quacks like a duck, can it be a duck? Well, we should remember that in such cases, this question is about identity. It's not necessarily about any sexual activity at all. These were deeply pious clergy, many deeply committed to physical, if not emotional, celibacy. But that consideration does not lessen the intensity or the reality of the emotions involved. And it is the key to understanding this peculiar nexus between Anglo-Catholicism and homosexuality. Clerical celibacy is at the root of it. And that's why the nexus developed as promptly as it did. You see, celibacy was one of the innovative borrowings which Anglo-Catholics made from Rome. Celibacy had never been a significant fi fi feature of traditional English high churchmanship. Now Anglo-Catholics placed an increasing insistence on the superiority of celibate vocation to the priesthood. And it was an opt-in celibacy. Of course, the Church of England went on having married clergy. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> but this emphasis on celibacy went along with a new emphasis on professional training. And the result was a new profession, the clerical profession, trained in theological colleges, not in universities so much. And Victorian England's only profession in which, thanks to the Anglo-Catholics, lifelong abstention from marriage did not cause too much raising of eyebrows. It was now respectable. So Anglican priesthood became a safe haven for those who found that abstention from marriage congenial. And the early clergy of the Oxford movement were natural rebels, conscious, conscious that they were overturning the complacent certainties of their day. As a consequence, they were likely to be powerful, charismatic personalities who attracted admirers to their churches and to the doctrine which they preach. Soon they were spreading out into the parishes of England, and many of those churches became permanent strongholds of the movement, their names reverently to be recited by those who knew them. And there were plenty of insinuations from the unsympathetic about the result of all this. Tractarianism ado adopted more and more extravagant outward liturgy from Rome, 
and gained public notoriety in the process. A typical comment is from an evangelical vi visitor in 1868 to the demonstratively Anglo-Catholic parish of St. Matthias Newington in London. Now, I guess he was conventionally bewhiskered as a Victorian gentleman should be, and he commented with daring innuendo about the vestments and the appearance of the clergy at St. Matthias. The style of dress and the close-shaven face, favoured so greatly by Im English imitators of Rome, do give to most men a rather juvenile, if not womanly, appearance. <laughs> A more sympathetic early 20th century description of the atmosphere is to be found in the once popular novel Sinister Street by Sir Compton Mackenzie, a writer who had reason to be familiar with this particular subculture. Mackenzie portrays what amounts to a pickup of the teenage hero Michael at solemn evensong at a thinly disguised St. Stephen's Bournemouth by a slightly older bank clerk called Prout. This is closely followed by Michael's initiation as a processional torchbearer into the exotic world of the Anglo-Catholic sacristy. I quote, The sacristy was crowded with boys in scarlet cassocks and slippers and zucchettos, quarrelling about their cotters and arguing about their heights. Everybody had a favourite banner which he wanted to escort, and to complicate matters still further, everybody had a favourite companion by whose side he wished to walk. Well, there were plenty of women in Anglo-Catholic parish congregations, but female relationships with father were given careful boundaries by priestly celibacy. It made the clergy safe and sexless. Father's ambiguous sexuality, combined frequently with an Oxbridge articulacy and extravagantly camp wit. And it was all welcome entertainment amid the dullness of housewives' everyday lives. Father's camp persona was an asset in providing a non-threatening and pastorally objective ministry to female parishioners. There was no need to name the love that dares not speak its name. And particularly in urban parishes, gay male Anglo-Catholics were part of a society which effortlessly crossed social boundaries. That was how Mr. Prout, the young bank clerk, could befriend the upper middle class public schoolboy, Michael and socialise with him at such events at the as the London reception for the legitimist Emperor of Byzantium at Clifford in Clifford's Inn Hall at a shilling a head. <laughs> Anglo-Catholicism, you see, was fun, hospitable to extrovert mischief in its rituals, and generally full of delight at the annoyance that it caused bishops by its extravagant borrowings from Roman Catholic ritual. Clerical studies and drawing rooms frequently resounded with howls of laughter at the latest expression of Episcopal or arch archaeodiaconal outrage. But not all was laughter. For many, there was the strain of conscientiously avoiding physical expression of their sexuality. So Geoffrey Clayton, our Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town in the 1950s, was really speaking to himself when in a confirmation sermon he urged... There may come a time when you are very greatly tempted, when this will be the one thing you want to do more than anything else, when your whole being will cry out, I want to do this, but you must never, never, never give in. Well, perhaps Archbishop Clayton would have been able to fight apartheid rather better if he, his historical circumstances had not forced so much of his energy to be diverted into this other, more personal struggle. Instead, Archbishop Clayton raged at braver souls like Bishops Trevor Huddleston and Ambrose Reeves, who are now remembered rather than Clayton as actors in the long drawn out destruction of apartheid. Gay Anglo-Catholic clergy were pledged by their vocation to preach truth and integrity but they constantly face the debilitating necessity of compromising their integrity by concealing a major part of the truth about themselves. It was the same cruelty of concealment that crypto-Jews faced in medieval Spain. It's a structural affliction for all Nicodemites, apart from that minority of spiritualists like the family of love who glory in their secrecy. And for some such clergy, sometimes at very senior levels in the church, there was the extra burden of blackmail. Yet when all the negatives have been placed on the scales, the gay male Anglo-Catholic ghetto in Britain long provided a reasonably safe and sympathetic area of male homosociability and emotional release 
in a nation which up to the 1960s had one of the most repressive attitudes to homosexuality in all Western Europe. Nemesis, however, came in the 1960s. Rome, to begin with, changed drastically with the Second Vatican Council, particularly in its liturgy, leaving the extrovert liturgical precision of the Anglo-Catholics in uncomfortable seclusion. Gay society also changed, steadily emerging into the open in the Western world over the next three decades. Worse still, it included lesbians in its message of liberation, <laughs> bewilderingly for traditionalist Anglo-Catholic gay men. At that point, the comfortable gay male Anglo-Catholic network across the globe ran into problems of identity and credibility. I can well remember from the 1970s and 1980s the resulting unhappy clash of cultures and personalities as gay liberation collided with what that prominent Anglo-Catholic socialist, Father Kenneth Leach, acerbically termed the world of gin, lace and backbiting. And after that clash, the various parties within Anglicanism realigned for a new struggle, how to relate to a reconfigured sexual landscape which Anglicans are still struggling with. But in the middle of that struggle, after a century and a half, this Nicodemite Christian subculture had outlived its usefulness within the Anglican world. The remaining great silences to examine can be grouped as silences of forgetfulness or oblivion. Things not remembered for both worthy and unworthy motives. Repeatedly, churches have built up their identity by forgetting things, which were no use remembering in the present. I'll begin with an example from the very frontiers of Western Christianity. The establishment of Christianity in Iceland in the 11th century. Now, the surprise which emerges from the earliest sources on the conversion of Iceland is the part played by Armenians. There were three Armenian bishops active in Iceland at the time of the first Catholic bishop in the 11th century. By the time that a later chronicler was writing around the year 1200, the Armenians had become simply a group of anonymous foreign bishops supported by local evil men. And in a chronicle of the mid 13th century, they'd simply disappeared from sight. What was going on? Obvious, I think. The presence of the Armenians in the conversion years could only have been thanks to Christian contacts with the Orthodox East via Kievan Rus and Novgorod. So they were coming up that great uh, uh, trajectory through Novgorod across Scandinavia into Iceland, as so many Scandinavians went the other way to Novgorod and Kiev. By the 13th century, however, Icelandic Christianity was now firmly within the Western Latin world, and Catholics and Orthodox Christians were increasingly hostile to each other to the point of crusades. For safely Catholic Iceland, the Armenians were not worth remembering. That's one great distorting factor in forgetting in Christian history. But uh, perhaps the greatest of all is the fact uh, that most of it has been written by men. The role of women in the earliest stages of building Christianity has faded, faded, as it's assimilated itself to the customarily male-dominated societies of the last 2,000 years. Clues to an alternative story are there right from the start, from the earliest Christian records we have, the letters of the Apostle Paul. Paul, as you will know, made some rather confused statements as to whether women should speak or not speak in church. But he is also a major witness to female office-holding. Uh, which later disappeared. In his seven indisputably authentic letters, various women are named as office holders. And that's hardly surprising, because the same thing is true of Hellenistic Jewish synagogues at the same time. That resonant word presbutera is to be found in Jewish tombstone inscriptions of the same period. There are women sitting on synagogue councils. So you'd expect that in early Christian communities too. Most strikingly is Paul's greeting list to the Romans, in the letter to the Romans. It includes Junia, a female, Apostle, so described alongside another, Apostle, with a male name. And this was considered such an appalling anomaly by many later readers of Romans that in the recopying of manuscripts, Junia's name was frequently changed to a male form 
or was simply regarded without any justification whatsoever as the name of a man. Early biblical commentators were actually quite honest about this. Uh, John Chrysostom is a very honourable uh, champion in that. They saw that this was a woman's name and they thought of ways round it. But it's not surprising that the Western Latin church in the 13th century begged to differ. And so from the time of the commentator Giles of Rome in the 13th century, Junia became a man in uh, all the uh, writings of the Western church. So this is the witness to a consistent pattern which we've noticed over various lectures. In times of trial, conflict, uh, formation, rapid innovation, men fall away from their accustomed leadership roles, partly because they're more likely than women to be the victims of punitive violence. In the place of men, female leadership re-emerges as a survival strategy for the church. The time for men to take over again has been when life returns to more tranquil patterns. <laughs> and the church conforms once more to the expectations of society around it. And the historical record is then adjusted to match the expectation. It's another melancholy historical recurrence that purposeful forgetting in Christian history has often involved the excision of sexual scandal or perceived scandal from the record. And I think one of the most interesting, profound explorations of that comes in uh, a very short essay by Professor Donald McKinnon, great name here in Scotland. Uh, one of his most bleak and most profound miniature theological essays, which in fact he calls Reflections on a Dark Theme. And in it, uh, Professor McKinnon briefly scans the career of three bright stars of modern philosophy, biblical scholarship, and theology. Gottlob Frege, Gerhard Kittel, and Paul Tillich. McKinnon points out Frege's systematic racism. He points out Kittel's active membership of the Nazi party. But he devotes particular attention to Tillich. Now here, Frank biography reveals Tillich's shameless and heartless sexual promiscuity. Alas, Tillich was a Gifford lecturer. <laughs> but you'll be glad to hear it at Aberdeen. <laughs> McKinnon places Tillich's career in the context of the experimental ethos of the Weimar Republic, and he sees in Tillich's reprehensible actions, I quote, a calculated, elaborately defended, yet always elaborately hidden perpetuation of a lifestyle involving an unacknowledged contempt for the elementary, demanding sanctities of human existence. Well, given such an indictment, one wonders how far any of Tillich's theological work can be taken seriously, given this lack of personal integrity. McKinnon was, of course, himself an engagingly adventurous theologian. But he suggests that one lesson to be learned from the career of Paul Tillich is that we have to reckon with the built-in risk of a deep corruption in a theology that would cultivate a temper of exploration. And McKinnon goes on to articulate a still deeper problem, which I think all charismatic preachers would do well to ponder. How far the heroic is a Christian category? Once more, we hear the Gnostic question, or the question posed by the Nicodemite spiritualists of the Reformation to Christian martyrs and their admirers. McKinnon's essay is a tribute to the value of the historical discipline in pulling mislabeled saints from their pedestals. No man is a hero to his valet, and it is always worth remembering when visiting shrines that one definition of a saint is someone who has not been researched well enough. <laughs> Finally, what is true of individuals is equally true of those Christian institutions which call themselves churches. Churches are perfectly capable of collectively knowing that they have done wrong, even by the standards of their own time, in circumstances which no amount of historical relativism can condone. Their acts of forgetting, their silences, can be the result of quite justified shame either because they've realized even at the time that shame is appropriate or because they have come to realize it later. Well, I could talk about clerical child abuse or Christian responsibility for anti-Semitism, but that would prolong this lecture beyond your tolerance. <laughs>
Instead, I'll take one example. Worldwide Christian attitudes to slavery, particularly as they have affected African Americans. To look back at Christian attitudes to slavery places a major question mark about traditional Christian ways of looking at the Bible. Modern evangelical Christians are particularly pleased with themselves in having been associated with the movement to abolish slavery. There is a mantra of late 18th century English names to recite. John Newton, Thomas Clarkson, William Wilberforce head the Pantheon, given their successful campaign first to abolish Britain's participation in the slave trade, then Britain's acceptance of slavery, then to end the acceptance of slavery generally in Christendom. But there's more than one problem with that narrative. In terms of origins, it ignores the fact that the earliest credit should not be given to these late 18th century evangelicals, but to early 18th century Quakers, and late 17th century Quakers come to that, whom evangelicals would emphatically not have appreciated at the time as Christians. There was a good reason why Quakers should get there before other Christians, and that reason should also give evangelicals pause. As we've seen, Quakers were spirituals, with a conviction of the prime authority of the inner light. Many of their earliest activists had sharply critiqued the problems of the scriptural text, and so the early Quakers helped to pioneer the modern Enlightenment discipline of biblical criticism. After all, this was a movement which depended on a rejection of the overriding authority of scripture as understood in the 17th century. The Quakers' disrespect for the established conventions of biblical authority were the reason that they could take a fresh perspective on biblical authority and reject it. It took original minds to kick against the authority of sacred scripture. What was needed was a prior conviction in one's conscience of the wrongness of slavery which one might then decide to justify by a purposeful re-examination of the Bible. The distressing fact for modern Christians, particularly evangelical Christians, is that slavery is taken for granted in the Bible, even if it is not always considered to be a good thing, particularly for yourself. Paul's epistle to Philemon is a Christian foundation document in the justification of slavery. Many modern Christians would vehemently disagree with my assessment, and they should be given credit for their generous wish to absolve the text and affirm its value for the modern age. But their case is not strong. Slave owners in the deep south of the United States in the 19th century were perfectly entitled to look to the Bible to justify their slave owning, and they were right to be surprised that other Christians disagreed with them. In fact, it is only in less than three Christian centuries out of 20 Christian centuries that churches and Christians have come round to saying that slavery is bad in all circumstances, full stop, period. Now Christians take this for granted. They have forgotten the huge moral revolution that has taken place to get them to where they are now on this subject, and how much effort it took some maverick souls over more than a century to persuade fellow Christians that this was the only way to think about slavery. In fact, that process was by no means complete by the end of the 19th century which is, again, a very important part of the abolition narrative often forgotten. Let me take you to the extraordinary story of Nakash theology, or perhaps more accurately, encounter Nakash theology, because it is still alive and well in racist circles in the United States of America. It is a racist theology, which sought to justify the subjection and inferior status of African Americans, ironically, by using the early stirrings of Western biblical criticism. Nakash theology made sense to a significant section of mainstream American society well into the 20th century, and it still has its fringe advocates. What was it? It took its origin from an innocent suggestion by an English Methodist biblical commentator, Adam Clark, very well respected and ironically an abolitionist. He made his suggestion in the heyday of abolition in the early 19th century in 1810. Uh, he was uh, commenting on the book of Genesis and he speculated that that very peculiarly articulate serpent, Nachash, 
who tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden was in fact, quite clearly not a snake, some, some other creature, what could it be? Well, um, Adam Clark suggested it was a creature of the ape or orangutan kind. Biblical scholars in Britain treated the idea with scorn. But within a few decades, it was taken up with enthusiasm by some in the United States. Why was that? To begin with, a schismatic Mormon, Charles B. Thompson, ironically a former Quaker. And what Thompson did was to make an identification which Clark had not made. He went on from the ape or orangutan to the negro. He said that the ape, the nakash, had been not just an orangutan, but a negro. And in the age of Charles Darwin, some racist Americans saw this as offering potentially a more scientifically respectable and coherent explanation of Negro origins than the long-standing attribution of Negro descent to Ham, who inconveniently, of course, had been descended from Adam. The Hermetic theory had that disadvantage from a racist point of view of relating Negroes to the same people as, as white people. And from Thompson, the idea spread to mainstream Christians in the south of the United States. Because for the likes of President Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy, it was a welcome theological accompaniment to secession and the defense of slavery. In effect, since the Negro was not fully human, there was no slavery of human beings in the South, and abolitionists were wasting their energy. The Confederacy was then defeated, but Nakash theology marched on. Two would-be intellectuals, Bucker H. Payne and Charles Carroll, both used this distorted biblical exegesis to say openly on occasions that it would be good to annihilate African Americans, who were, after all, only apes, and particularly degraded and threatening ones had they not tried to seduce Eve in the Garden of Eden. So Nakash theology lived on in respectable southern circles into the 20th century decades even after the achievement of civil rights. It still fuels the thinking of American white supremacist groups. Thus have the well-meaning critical speculations of a Methodist abolitionist been perverted to a new use which would have appalled him. Now the importance of reciting this dismal genealogy is that it forcefully reminds us that the task of remembering the Christian record on slavery is not yet complete. There have been some honorable amends made. So the oldest Anglican Missionary Society, the United Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, has belatedly recognized that its predecessor, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, was involved up to its neck in slavery, to the extent of having its own West Indian plantation and its own branding iron, SPG, for enslaved Africans working on that plantation. Nevertheless, the Society's website now appears evasive on the subject of its involvement in slavery, despite an excellent, pitiless recent academic study of the Society's record published last year. Selective memory is always a danger for the Church, and it would always involve further probing to find the silences which still demand ending. The issue of British involvement in the slave trade brought a dramatic example of that in the most solemn of English liturgical contexts, a national service in Westminster Abbey in March 2007. This commemorated the bicentenary of the abolition of the slave trade, and it was envisaged as an event combining thanksgiving, remembrance, penitence, and perhaps out of that, healing. It's been very carefully scripted. Present were the Queen, the Prime Minister, the Archbishop of Canterbury, plus the political and religious elite of the nation, including representatives of black communities. As the service proceeded, the Dean of Westminster's conduct of an act of penitence was suddenly both shatteringly interrupted and given a more vivid colouring. Toyin Agbetu of the African rights organisation Ligali walked into the centre of the abbey from the south transept to add a noisy protest to the liturgical mixture. There was pushing, struggling, a blow or two, as Mr. Agbetu pointed at the monarch, shouting, you, the queen, should be ashamed, and to Tony Blair, you should be sorry. Agbetu was then forcibly escorted out of the church to the accompaniment of a rather typical English mixture of deep embarrassment, heart-searching, and barely suppressed excited fascination. <laughs> this 
this being, this being Britain in all its flawed attempts to do the right thing, he was able to preface his arrest outside the Abbey by an improvised press conference. <laughs> setting out just why such an event should apologize for two and a half centuries of English involvement in the slave trade. And that was a most interesting liturgical act. Not all will agree that Agbeta was justified in this particular extension of the day's ceremonial. But one interpretation of his actions is that they were a necessary completion of what was missing in that bicentenary service a cancellation of silence which had not otherwise been provided for. Silences such as those demand constant rupture. On such noise does the health of Christian society depend. And in our final session, we'll assess the health of silence in Christianity in the present age. Thank you. What a superb lecture. <clears throat> great wit, great humor, but moving themes as well. The silence of fear and shame. And I'm sure a number of you will want to stay for the questions. But as is our custom, those of you who do have to slip away, please feel free to do that in the next couple of minutes. Okay, well, we've got about 10, 15 minutes for questions. There is a cordless microphone. If you could raise your hand, let yourself be known, yes. Um, concerning Nicodemism, I wonder if there's a modern uh, instance of this in Northern Ireland. Uh, is there any record of the attitudes of clergy in Northern Ireland to the violence there. Nicodemism in Northern Ireland. I think there are a lot of things which are said in private in Northern Ireland. I don't think we'd be in the present situation if there had not been. I don't think it's Nicodemism in, uh, the essence of Nicodemism is a group identity which is hidden from others. Now I don't think we're seeing that in Northern Ireland. We may, we may see people who are uh, discreet in their opinions about perhaps members of their own church or uh, uh, avoiding provocative things to say about others. But that's not quite the same. What, where I think one would look in the modern world would be to uh, Pakistan, to a lesser extent India, but definitely China. Now there, there are huge numbers of Nicodemite Christian communities, huge numbers. Uh, it's, it's been calculated, and I mean, there's a complete guess, that uh, they may represent the, the fifth largest church in the world. And what happens when these churches eventually get their voice? We don't know. Uh, will they bring with them an experience of Nicodemism which they want to expunge? Or will they bring with it lessons for the rest of the church? Uh, so that's the sort of place I think you'd look in the modern world, places where the church is actually repressed or certain sorts of Christianity are repressed. The same may well be true in Saudi Arabia. You obviously couldn't talk about everything and you chose the excellent example of slavery um, for the discussion of particular uses of silence. I wonder if you would have any comment to make on the kind of silencing which continues to happen in some places and has been um, broken apart in others of the victims of um, abuse um, particularly children and women yeah. who are silenced simply by the fact that apparently nobody believes them or um, they're morally blackmailed in order to keep silent. Absolutely. This, I mean, one of the reasons I didn't talk about it, it's such a painful and explosive subject to talk about. I do have a section in, in, in the book uh, which, in which I can much expand these lectures. Um, well, I think there are several things one could say. First, uh, it seems to me that the crisis of authority uh, which has emerged in the Roman Catholic Church as a result uh, 
is not so much about the abuse itself, horrible though that is, and absolutely disgraceful. It is the attempts at cover up. And what uh, I actually concentrate on the book is not the contemporary cover up, but the fact that there was an exactly similar pattern of cover up in the 17th century. Uh, among uh, a religious order, and it was an order, founded at the, end, at the beginning of the 17th century called the Pierists. Uh, an, an order which founded by an extremely holy and austere Spanish uh, uh, founder who wanted to provide free education for the poor. And so he set up this order of Pierists, uh, which unfortunately was then infiltrated. One, one thing he didn't have was good judgment about uh, as uh, his seconds in command. And he chose an absolute rotten apple who turned out to be a child abuser and also uh, destroyed the discipline of the Pierists. Uh, and uh, the, the founder, St. Joseph Calasance, confronted with this situation, covered it up. We have the archive in which it is painfully clear that again and again he covered it up uh, to save the reputation of the Pierists, but also to save the reputation of the aristocratic families from whom these abusers had emerged. So the poor were suppressed, their voices were not heard because of that, and the record is there in the Florentine archive. It's been wonderfully excavated by a young American scholar who has published a book, which I was interested to find was not in the Oxford University Library System, though it's an extremely uh, convincing work of scholarship. Uh, I, no conspiracy there, but it's just... I, I had to buy a copy from Amazon in order to read it. <laughs> Um, but what, what I think uh, that's saying is there is something very important and serious to be uh, uh, identified about the pattern of child abuse within the Western Latin Church, and it, it is distinctly associated with Western Latin Church since the Counter-Reformation. Why? I think it's not a Nicodemite phenomenon. In other words, there's no continuous hidden society of child abusers. What there is is a set of discrete, ETE type discrete, discrete individual responses to a single structural problem, compulsory clerical celibacy. No other church in Christendom has ever tried compulsory clerical celibacy, and it was not real in the Western Latin church until the Counter-Reformation. Uh, it had been an, a, an aspiration since the 12th century. So I think what you're getting is a series of anguished responses from um, heterosexuals mostly, to a new discipline which, which really isn't suitable for them at all. They have not opted into it like my Anglo-Catholics have. They have had it imposed on them. And they have reacted, some of them have reacted, very badly indeed to that phenomenon. So that, that seems to me to be a structural causal reason why it uh, has been particularly associated with the, the Roman Church. Over here. Oh, yeah, okay. That's, uh, there was also one. Um, you mentioned earlier on the silence, well, the silencing of uh, the role of women in the early church, and you mentioned how Chrysostom tried to explain away um, Julia in the Pauline text, and I was just curious if you could expand on that to say how Chrysostom tried to explain that? Oh, well, I think it was in terms of uh, look at the marvel of God's providence here that even a woman can be addressed as an apostle uh, in these heroic days of the church. And someone else may remember better than me as to uh, how he used it. It's, it's one of his homilies. Uh, it's a homily on, on, on that particular passage in Romans. And he faces up to it. He says, look, look, this junior is a woman. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it marvellous? But in the sense that it's not part of what you'd expect from the female uh, sex. It is, it's not, they are not, therefore, destined to be bishops. But uh, he is one of the great preachers in the church's history. But the answer in the Western Latin church is, is just to change it, or to invent a, a new male name, Junius, otherwise you know, un, unprecedented. No other example. And there was a question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor McCulloch, for your wonderful lectures on the last topic you dealt with there a moment ago without going into the details.
I can speak of three people who have come to me to tell me about the tragic events in the church I call mine, but I often want to apologise for being a Roman Catholic priest because of what some of my brethren have done and what some of the hierarchy are still doing. Some of my brothers and sisters in the family of the church and other denominations, some of them here present, know about that. But apart from that, I give thanks to God for the Reformation, uh, but want to express a sadness that out of it came so much division at the time and then more. And maybe this is a question for tomorrow night rather than tonight, but with yourself having the long view, as it were, of church history, I wonder, is there any hope, you think, somewhere, are there any signs of hope uh, that there might yet be reform, real basic reform in the Roman Catholic Church where the people of God have their dignity that St. Peter speaks of in his first letter, a holy people, a consecrated nation, etc., and where we might get accountability, not to the Pope or to the bishops, but from them, and have a mutual accountability. That might be a vain hope, but just asking if you see any outward signs of that out of your knowledge of history. Thank you. Thank you for yes, that very impassioned comment and question. Well, I'm uh, something of a, a, a hedgerow Hegelian. I do think that conflict is a sign of health and conflict uh, is a mark that there is resolution ahead. I am not exactly delighted by the present travails of the Anglican Communion, but I do think it's a very healthy conflict to have. It's about real things. And it is, it seems to me, moving. Now, a similar conflict seems to me to be bubbling inside the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and it goes right back to Vatican II. I mean, I'm, I'm, taught, I'm preaching, I think, to the converted here that there are two absolutely opposed views of what happened at Vatican II. And the present Vatican bureaucracy has one, and uh, many others, I think, probably see the reality of Vatican II rather better. Uh, but the sheer embattled nature of the present Vatican bureaucracy seems to me to be a very healthy sign that you are not embattled until you know the game's up. <laughs> and the, the stridency of uh, the present uh, courtiers of Pope Benedict is uh, sad, but it is the sign of uh, those who are, uh, realize the sand castle is about to be swept away. And I, I, I will make some comments in my last lecture on, on the, the question of authority generally in the church and whether any of the patterns within the Episcopal churches can be sustained in their present form. I'm not, I'm, you know, my background is Episcopal, but uh, there, are, there are helpful models of leadership and there are unhelpful ones. And I do think it is very interesting, if you look at the 19th century, the gradual emergence of um, liberal uh, democracy in it's 19th century Europe, uh, and the one uh, body traveling in exactly the opposite direction is the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Vatican I uh, establishes a monarchy, just at the time when every other place is, uh, dis, uh, is actually getting rid of the powers of monarchy. And that was uh, a bad turn. Vatican II started down the road of dismantling that, but didn't get very far. So I, I'm all for conflict, and I, I, I think uh, there is a pressure cooker building up in uh, the Roman Catholic world. I think maybe one more question. Um, you mentioned in your lecture that um, between the late uh, 17th century and early 18th century, there was a great change in the mm. attitude towards um, sexuality. Mm. Um, what are the reasons for that, and are there any parallels in, in, our, in our time? Well, I think we're still living in the aftermath of it. Um, it is a, a most mysterious moment. I talk about it quite a bit in my book on the Reformation. And there's a very fine recent book by a man with an extremely complicated name, uh, one of my Oxford colleagues, Faramir's W. Waller, who talks about the sexual revolution in 18th century England. Uh, and and I, th I think the clue possibly to understanding why it happened 
is where it happened. It's England and the Netherlands. And these are the two countries in Europe which first got away from famine. They're the first two economies which say goodbye to the possibility of large people systematically normally starving because the harvest, harvest has failed. They've established economies where it is possible to feed everyone. Now, the moment you get past survival, you get past the structures which human beings erect to save yourself against survival, mostly the family. And you then start thinking, well, if I now have a society in which I buy things because I like to buy them, not because I have to buy them, I buy a pin, I buy a little pot, all sort of consumer goods of the 18th century world, that means I'm beginning to think, who am I? What, what do I want, rather than what society makes me want because it has to? So I, th I think there is actually, and I think many a, a moralist preacher would make a lot of this, a connection between consumerism and the sexual revolution of the 18th century. They are part of a, a, an exploration of the self, which has been such a characteristic of the Western world over the last two centuries, three, three centuries. And there's a lot you can deplore in the exploration of the self but it has a lot of good results too. And I think Christianity has not really caught up with it. Uh, the first reaction of Christianity was to deplore the self and say the self is a very bad thing. And of course, many of our mystics, uh, uh, we've been examining, many of our mystics would say, yeah, the self is, is precisely what, where you don't go. But um, I, I, for instance, I, I very recently read, many of you will have read Sarah Maitland's Book of Silence. I think that's a very splendid uh, weighing up of the problems be, uh, of the mystic in relation to the self. Uh, so there's a very random set of thoughts, but I, I leave with you the, the injection of the thought, consumer revolution, abolition of famine, exploration of the self, and I think they're all connected. We've had another superb lecture. I think we have a, there's a real feeling about where this whole series is going too, and uh, it's been good to see such a loyal following among the audience as well. We have one more lecture on Thursday evening, 5.30, and I hope as many of you as possible will come along. We, we can fill the hall, <laughs> but could you join me once again in thanking Professor McCarthy? This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.